who do you think? Uh, <laughs> I guess it depends whether they're in person or not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's true. The last one I was all set up for, and then yes. I realized it was in person. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> okay, I think this can get started then. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone to this SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies uh, uh, special uh, lecture. Today we'd really like to welcome uh, Gary Price for his first ever uh, SOAS um, uh, talk. Um, or his first ever in-person SOAS uh, uh, talk. So Gareth um, is now based at uh, Duke University where he teaches in the linguistics program and he's also a member of the uh, Asia-Pacific Studies uh, Institute. Um, he got his PhD in linguistics from the uh, University of Essex uh, in 2009. And that was when we, um, most of us first met uh, Gareth. He was part of the uh, European Taiwan Studies Conference in, in Bochum back in 2006. So it's kind of a really nice, nice kind of funny meet Gareth again on, in person. Um, although we did meet him um, uh, online when he gave an online talk uh, for us in um, uh, 2021 uh, uh, on his book Language, Society and the State from Colonization to Globalization uh, in, uh, in Taiwan, the book which came out in 2019 and then in paperback in 2021. I know it's a book that uh, we do include in our uh, culture and society in Taiwan uh, class, which uh, I can see uh, a few of you uh, uh, have, uh, have taken. Um, Gareth is going to speak for about um, uh, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have uh, lots of time for uh, discussion. And again, we're really delighted that by chance we've got this theme of uh, migration uh, in Taiwan has become our kind of main uh, theme. So I think it's sort of like our third or fourth talk um, on, uh, on, this, uh, on this topic. So let's give uh, Gareth a very big um, uh, welcome in person to uh, the service. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Thank you for having me here today. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here, and it is nice to be here in person and not just online um, uh, on, a, on a screen here. Um, so um, uh, this is the um, uh, this is the, uh, the, the the title of the talk uh, today: "Privileged Outsiders: A Sociolinguistic Investigation of Foreign Communities in Taipei." Um, and um, there we are. So um, the um, outline is here. I first ventured to Taiwan in 2001. I stayed until 2007. Um, and apart from a couple of semesters here and there back uh, doing my master's at Essex and my PhD at Essex and back uh, for field work for uh, two or three years. Um, I, and I've, I've been back to Taipei and, and Taiwan on, uh, uh, on various sort of trips here uh, uh, since then. Um, my last book uh, was on the politics of language in Taiwan, but I've always been fascinated by language migration. And I'm particularly interested at the moment in uh, foreign populations uh, in Taiwan. And specifically, I'm interested in uh, migrants from the global north, conventionally, though problematically known as expats. Um, I should emphasize how problematic, and I've got scare quotes for expats here, how problematic um, uh, the term expats actually is. It's a demonym that refers to a group of people, um, uh, uh, but it artificially distinguishes elite migrants, uh, usually from the global north, from, from other migrants. Um, in popular and academic usage, it is uh, often used and under-theorised um, and re rejected by some and ardently embraced by others. Um, and I use it in quotation marks to demonstrate just how unstable it is. Um, and at the same time, how the term expats um, is reflective and productive of certain socio-political, cultural and sociolinguistic realities. So it's a, it's a problematic term. You'll hear me use expats You'll hear me refer to northern migrants, migrants from the global north. I use those terms sort of interchangeably here. But I, I, expats is a is a it's 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 something um, 
uh, it's, it's, it's at the heart of this research here. So today we're going to look at um, the expat research projects, um, just sort of an overview, some of the research questions, uh, the methodology here. Um, I've got some theory from sociology, anthropology and geography, and some uh, theory from sociolinguistics. I'm hoping to marry the two uh, happily. Um, and, um, and then um, uh, I've got some data from interviews um, uh, uh, with uh, northern migrants uh, in, in, in Taiwan, and that's sort of the, 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 the talk. And I've got some very tentative conclusions about what some of this sort of might uh, mean here. Um, the data that I'm uh, presenting today uh, is from a, is part of a wider project looking at expats in Taiwan and Thailand. Um, and um, from refugees to tourists, people move in different ways and for different reasons uh, across the globe, impacting tens of millions of people directly and indirectly. Um, traditionally, uh, migration studies more broadly, that's in sociology, anthropology and geography, has focused on flows from the global south rather than from the global north. Um, there are good reasons for focusing on flows from the global south. The majority of migration is from the global south uh, or within the global south. Um, and these flows from the global south give rise to uh, some of the most profound humanitarian challenges that we face in the world today. Um, the emphasis on um, migration are from the global south. The emphasis has changed slightly in the last um, about a decade or a little bit longer than a decade or so. Um, and the, there's a recognition that if you uh, ignore migration from the global north, you actually elide the complexity of human migration sort of more broadly here. And we'll, we'll come back to that point uh, about why study migrants from the global north. And I've got some, 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 uh, some, some work to look at on that here. Um, um, but the study of migrants from the global north is still something of a niche field um, uh, in uh, migration studies. Um, the, the key thing here is, is that um, uh, 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 migrants from the, in the broader scheme of international migration, migrants from the global north are inherently more privileged um, than migrants from the global south. And that is because um, uh, the, the, these, these privileges are mobilized as various forms of capitals uh, uh, here. Um, and these privileges in, include um, privileges based on citizenship, passport, uh, visa regimes, transnational class position, and often, though not always, race. Um, at the same time, privilege is always relative, and this project examines the interplay between privilege and precarity, manifested in material challenges, biopolitical controls, and estrangements from nations, cultures, and languages of origin, as well as difficulties integrating linguistically and uh, culturally into their new societies here. So, Structurally, um, migrants are north from the global north are more privileged, uh, but that but privilege is always relative, and then um, and the way it's distributed in individual cases at micro levels is 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 is, is, is something worth investigating here. Um, uh, so um, here are the research questions here. Um, we'll look at this first one. Um, Mainly today, I'm moving out of my camera spot here. Uh, so, I, I have to pace across. Um, uh, this is the main question we're looking at. How do northern migrants co construct their migration trajectories and experiences narratively, discursively, and semiotically in online and offline spaces here? That's the main question we'll be looking at today here. Um, uh, how and why do they learn the languages of their host societies? That's uh, an important dimension of, of, of what we'll look at. We'll look at, we'll look at that in some detail today here. Um, uh, how do they talk about precarity and privilege in the context of lived meanings? This is the, this is more complex, and we we'll, we'll, we'll do less of this today. This is still a sort of work in progress. Exactly how that sort of plays out, um, how people talk about it and negotiate that. Um, uh, uh, those, those interplays there. Um, I've got some data on the next question. How do they articulate the distinctions between migrant and expat and uh, or emplace themselves between different and sometimes conflicting transaction, transnational conceptions of home here? Um, and there's another question here which we won't get to today, although perhaps in the Q&A you, you might want to ask me about it. It doesn't quite fit in what I'm doing today here, but it's an important question here. Um, 
there are expats, who, people who identify themselves as expats, who don't come from the global north um, and come from the global south. And the question is how, in this sort of research, do we um, um, do we situate those voices in, in, in the research as well? Um, but um, that's, uh, again, that's sort of a working... I've got some interesting data from Taipei on this, actually, uh, but it's uh, that's, that's still one of the aspects of the work in progress here. Um, the, it's qualitative data, it's ethnographically informed. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I've been monitoring social media sites, including Facebook, uh, uh, groups and pages, um, blogs and forums. Um, certainly in the last, well, since social media has been around, um, expat communities sort of coalesce in online spaces. Um, in really interesting ways, and perhaps um, and connect um, in interesting ways here. Um, I've then uh, done quite a lot of in-person uh, in interviews with migrants from the global north and some from the global south. Um, uh, this is convenience and snowball sampling. Uh, I've put adverts on Facebook uh, groups. Um, that's gone sometimes gone well and sometimes not, <laughs> um, this, which is another methodological question that uh, we, we can explore. Um, I did, was, I was out in Thailand and Thailand in 2019, of course the pandemic comes along and sort of stops all that, uh, um, and I'm going back to Thailand um, uh, in this summer, and then I'll be in Taiwan uh, uh, hopefully uh, next summer to, to, to do more interviews here. And so far I've got 32 open-ended interviews, um, uh, 16 from Taiwan and Thailand, um, of about an hour and a half in length, um, and they're open-ended and semi-structured. And I'm aiming for about a hundred interviews, all told, for the for the book project. Um, these are not um, statistically representative populations. Uh, they, they're snowball sampling and convenient sampling means that they. But, but the, the, this is qualitative work. I've got to emphasise that, not quantitative uh, statistical work here. I've got a thousand media texts um, uh, uh, collected, which I'm still going through and in the process of um, of looking at as we uh, as we as we, we uh, as we go on. Um, why studying northern northern migrants? Well, um, I, I said I'd come back to this. Um, well, for me personally, the answer to this is that I am, or I was, um, a northern migrant. In fact, I live in the United States now, so to some extent I still am a northern <laughs> migrant. Um, I kind of, uh, I, I, and so uh, I, in some senses I, I, I still am. Um, but I, 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 I've been in this position um, and I've sort of kind of inhabited this space and, and, and this, um, I, was, I was saying earlier that um, actually I wanted to look at this um, uh, for my PhD, uh, but the, really the theory wasn't, wasn't there at that point here. Um, there's various answers to this have been proposed in the literature here. Uh, Sarah Penn's um, uh, work here, um, uh, um, the focus on the global south risks the reproduction of a skewed image of migrants and immigrants as non-Western, non-white, non-elite subjects here um, and um, put another way leaving northern migrants out of the picture contributes to the invisibility of privilege in international migration and it's that invisibility uh, which defines its power here and that leads us on to the second question this is about migration in, ge in, in general here this is just like from the sociologists uh, British sociologists here um, uh, that um, that, that it's related to this, and it's in a, in, a, in, a, in a broader sociological sense here. Studying elite privilege um, is uh, important because if you construct, well, I'll read it, constructing a narrative solely around the characteristics and problems of the most disadvantaged people and places does not address how the power and privileges of the advantages of the advantaged are organized here. And um, once again, the invisibility of privilege is key to how it operates uh, as a logic of power in this sense here. Um, and I think these two quotes speak to each other in really important ways and define um, kind of the research project. Um, and they're, they're kind of um, relatively recent um, kind of uh, uh, theorizations in, in sociology and migration studies more broadly, which brings us on to um, the theoretical foundations um, here. Um, uh, I draw from geography, sociology, and anthropology, as well as, uh, as, as social science backgrounds here, um, as well as from sociolinguistics 
um, as, uh, as a hodgepodge of theoretical frameworks here. Um, but from geography, uh, the mobilities paradigm here, uh, human mobility implicates both physical bodies moving um, through uh, material landscapes and categorical figures moving through representational spaces. Representational spaces uh, are linguistically and more accurately sociolinguistically defined, not just in the languages we speak, but the discursive cultural frameworks uh, we use to make meaning, uh, to make sense of our worlds and our lived experiences here. So we're not just, people don't, don't just move, all right? The, the, that movement, uh, migration, mobility, um, has social meanings and the particular sort of meanings uh, that we are, uh, uh, that are amenable to analysis, um, arguably from a sociolinguistic uh, point of view here. Um, more here from the um, uh, from sociology and anthropology here. Um, uh, uh, two paradigms that come from uh, from these disciplines here are the notions of high skilled migration and lifestyle migration. Um, these are related to the mobilities paradigm in geography, and they explain how and why migrants from the global north tend to move in distinct but also similar ways compared to the better studied migrants from the global south. Um, and in particular, high skilled migration here um, is uh, not fundamentally dissimilar to labour migration um, more uh, more broadly, in that high skilled migrants uh, move for employment reasons, uh, there are differences in the sense that um, the work of high skilled migration is usually better paid than local salaries. Um, so there's a distinction there. Um, the cultural capital of migrants, such as educational qualifications, language skills and passports, are valued in specific ways. Um, visa categories are often privileged for high skilled migrants. Um, and crucially, from a policy perspective, high skilled migration is often more palatable in the eyes of public opinion. Um, uh, I've got I've got to show you something here. Um, there is, uh, this is pewed research, so take that as you, as, as you will here, but um, people tend, even if they oppose mig uh, migration more broadly, um, they will, um, uh, people tend to um, uh, view high skilled migration more positively even when they, they, they kind of look at migration more broadly. So you can see whether they have privileges working here in, 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 in particular sort of sort of sort of ways uh, here, um, which is uh, now there's some important caveats here. Um, this is not to say, however, that all high skilled migrants are from the global north, nor that all migrants from the global north are high skilled migrants. Yeah, so that's important to 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 that's the caveat there. Um, but through structural constraints, and media, political and lay discourses, migrants from the global north become indexically linked with high skilled migration and vice versa. High skilled migrants, migrants from the global north become associated with each other in, the, in, the, in, in, in popular imagery. Um, and sort of high skilled migrants become these categorical figures based on citizenship, native language, transnational class position and often but not always uh, race as well. So if we have a look at that one there, um, this is less um, uh, this is less of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a of a of a of a of a this is less of a paradigm that relates to Taiwan because and it does relate in, in more uh, concrete ways to Thailand. Um, but this is lifestyle migration. This is not moving for employment in the sense in the same sense as high skilled migration. This is um, chasing the good life. Um, often people, um, uh, 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 retirees, for example, or they're living on other sort of sorts of income here, they're not in general moving for work. Um, uh, global nomads arguably fall into this category uh, to some degree in that global nomad nomads are not moving specifically for work reasons, um, but they are moving, uh, they 
work in different places, but so they, they sort of they, they fall into a, a, a sort of a grey area here. But this, this is a kind of some burgeoning research in here, and there's quite a considerable body of work actually, um, and looked at um, uh, Croucher. And so the, the first, probably the first one was O'Reilly in 2000, who looked at British in Spain. Um, uh, Croucher has looked at Americans in Mexico, um, and then Hayes looked at Americans in Ecuador. Um, Botterill's looked at British retirees in Thailand and so on and so forth here. And there's one book which is sort of the first sociolinguistic analysis of this phenomenon. Uh, and uh, that's the, the Lawson's, Michelle Lawson's book on the British in France, which came out a few years ago. Um, and that's the first to explore the sociolinguistic um, dimensions of, of, of lifestyle migration. So as you can see, a, there is some work in sociology, anthropology and geography. Um, uh, but there's less work in the sociolinguistic dimensions of it, and I'm hoping to sort of fill that gap by, by looking at that. And we'll get to uh, sociolinguistics um, in, a, in a second here. Um, I'm not sure how many people are sociolinguists here. Oh, hooray! <laughs> Hello. Um, so uh, what I do, uh, I'm not going to go. I, I give, I'll give you a potted history of sociolinguistics here. What um, uh, um, the, the three concepts that I'm using from sociolinguistics, and that is um, uh, scale, um, uh, complexity, and mobility here. Um, uh, so a quick. What used to happen is that sociolinguistics uh, or sociolinguists um, in the mid 20th century would go to uh, rural communities and they would uh, uh, invariably look at non mobile older rural males called norms um, and uh, <laughs> and they were and these the, these folks here were um, they were. Um, uh, 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 they were the most conservative speakers in that they were likely to preserve forms of their older dialects here. Yeah, and so these were the most conservative speakers. They were pre preserving forms of, of, of older dialects that were spoken, and sociolinguists were sort of interested in, in this here. But this was kind of deeply criticised from the 1960s here onwards. Um, it failed to capture, capture large segments of the population, um, including women and young people. Um, and uh, and it failed to capture the dynamics of internal migration that were happening, and this was especially in the, in the, in the UK and the US where it was, the discipline was, was burgeoning, um, you know, post-war internal migration that was, was, was happening here. Um, and sort of um, uh, cities um, became the new focus of sociolinguistic research. There's uh, uh, De Labov, uh, Wolfram and, and Trudgill, among others. Um, and migration and cross-cultural research begins sort of in the 70s, 80s, um, uh, and then and continue with uh, Rampton's study in 1995. Um, that's sort of less important than the fact that it's taken to 2017 for a Routledge handbook on migration and language to come out, um, which is... Uh, you know, there's, that's not to say that something just started happening, um, but it's taken a while to sort of, for that work to coalesce in sociolinguistics in terms of language and migration here. It's, it's all sort of scattered. Um, uh, and um, this uh, handbook, uh, the work in this handbook, is influenced by the mobilities paradigm, which we looked at from geography just a few slides ago, um, and uh, in the social sciences more broadly here. Um, a little bit before this um, uh, uh, handbook, um, Blommer, Jan Blommer uh, turns his attention to a sociolinguistics of globalization in 2010. Um, drawing on the notion of languages less as static systems and more as repertoires. Um, and these repertoires consist of language or lang or bits of language, but also semiotic resources, uh, systems of signs uh, that reconfigure the way identities and cultures are constructed, co-constructed, negotiated and in some cases resisted as well here. Uh, while not new as, uh, or not always new as practices, the ways of conceptualizing them are new and this changes our understanding of what it means to belong here. And this is um, from Kenna Garaja's uh, introduction to the handbook. In the place of territorialized, bounded and static ways of talking about language and social practices, 
we are now adopting constructs that index their mobile, hybrid and constructed nature here. So those um, uh, uh, notions of scale, uh, complexity, um, and mobility. I'll talk for a couple of minutes just about what this, these notions of scale, complexity and mobility here. Um, they can be put to work in the study of, my, of contemporary migration more broadly, but including in migration from the global north. Um, first, we have scales and scales can be spatial or temporal. Um, uh, or space, um, space or time, um, and often they interact, um, they're both spatial and temporal scales, particularly when we think of globalisation as the compression of time and space together here. So scales can be, um, uh, the, and we've got something called chronotypes here, um, uh, 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 I'll get to that in a second, but um, these uh, scales uh, uh, exist in layered ways, um, uh, uh, in Blomet's uh, term here, a linguistic utterance or a semiotic sign uh, interacts across different scales of time and space. And another way to think about this is sort of how any piece of language is both spatial and temporal and often in multifaceted ways here. And if this seems to sort of kind of slightly theoretical at this point, um, it went, uh, hopefully the data will show um, that why this is a useful um, theoretical construct here. Um, complexity um, is, a, is, is a little bit more grounded here. Um, and it means that social categories such as citizenship or national identity, but also race and gender and so on, can uh, no longer be statically linked with language practices. This is to say that we can no longer take for granted the relationships between categories and language practices. And in some senses, we can't even take those categories as stable uh, anymore here. Um, there is, um, uh, uh, in particularly contemporary globalization, perhaps this has been true for longer, uh, an instability in these supposedly stable social categories of national identity and citizenship and things like that. Um, that doesn't mean sort of kind of postmodern anything goes. Um, we were not, we're not quite there yet, but we, we have to sort of think about kind of complexity as an analytical lens for, for what we're talking about here. Um, and when we think about scale and complexity, uh, we can um, we can think about mobility, um, the uh, not just as people move moving or migrating, but the ways in which they move through different scales, different levels of social and linguistic complexity, and different semiotic and linguistic repertoires. Um, by repertoires, I mean thinking about language not as static named systems uh, such as Chinese or Taiwanese or English. Um, uh, but overlapping and open-ended systems here. Um, the notion of repertoires also extends to registers and styles, which from a sociolinguistic perspective is about who, what we, language we use to talk to different people, things that are including levels of formality and things like that, so registers and, 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 and styles. So um, how we speak to uh, uh, grandma, for example, is not how we speak to our, kind of our, 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 our friends, friends in the street, uh, for example. And there's the shifting in different registers and styles here. Um, and these can be expressed through narratives about migrants and migration, uh, spoken or written discourses, um, and the deployment of uh, different semiotic resources, um, and learning and speaking or speaking about non-native languages, I use that term advisedly, um, um, as, uh, and different levels of competence in languages which are being learned in the migration process here. All right, so I'm going to get to some data very, very shortly here. Um, and um, uh, I just want to talk briefly here about um, uh, some work that's already been done on Taiwan uh, by Lan Pei Chia, who's um, at uh, uh, National Taiwan University, uh, a sociologist. You might know her book, Global Cinderella's, um, more than this paper here. Um, and she did this fantastic paper on this in 2011. I came quite late to this research, to this research here, and I won't do it justice by summarising it here. Um, but the gist is that um, she explores privilege and precarity um, um, in what she calls Westerners um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Taipei. Um, and uh, it's a seminal paper in the global, the, in, in global north migration studies, um, uh, lots of lots of citations of this paper here. It's not as uh, theoretically um, 
developed as some of the more recent work, but that's because it was so seminal that it, it, it was it was path breaking at the time, and it's contributed to the theorization that has happened uh, since then here. Um, and so um, and, and so uh, uh, I diverged from it in the sense that I um, I'm not. Uh, it's not really about language in the same sense as I'm using the term language or discussing the concept of language here. Um, Land's talking about language as a cultural capital that, in, in her terms, can be flexibly converted um, and uh, into economic capital uh, as English teachers or language workers. But this work is a useful point of departure and a useful point of comparison uh, from here. And uh, I particularly like her quote here um, that uh, the macrostructural constraints and intermediate institutions challenge the glorious image of free-floating cosmopolitans, uh, as, she, as she puts it here. Um, so um, uh, let's go back to the research questions here. Um, let's look at these again. These aren't or shouldn't be isolated from each other, uh, but understood as overlapping um, and, uh, and relational here. And so we're going to look at some of these questions and some of this uh, in, in relation to the, um, uh, the data that I've, I've got here. Um, and I've got, start, we'll start with this question, in, this question here. How do northern migrants construct or co-construct their migration trajectories and experiences narratively, discursively and semiotically in online and offline uh, spaces here? Um, there's a quote from Tofino in saying here, uh, telling stories is a way of sharing and making sense of, uh, of it. this is about narratives. Uh, telling stories is a, a way of sharing and making sense of experience in the recent or remote past and of recounting important emotional uh, uh, or traumatic events and the minutiae of everyday life. Stories are essential in conveying moral values and social norms and teaching them to children. They are central to the construction of individual and collective identities and are used to index ways of being and social identifications here. Furthermore, stories carry weight in important institutional encounters such as employment and immigration processes. And I think that really captures what narratives do. And the data I'm going to present now for a few minutes here um, is, is, is very much concerned with um, uh, uh, those uh, narratives and how people talk about their migration experiences, in this case, uh, from the global north uh, uh, and uh, migrants from the global north um, who, who, who end up uh, in Taipei here. Um, here's a migration narrative here. This is from uh, Lisa. It's uh, from a much longer interview. It's just a snippet. Um, it's from a much longer interview of over an hour. Um, and uh, she's a 28 year old white woman from the USA talking about her migration to Taiwan. Um, and she says, so first, and she's talking about graduation here, I like didn't know what to do, so I became a substitute teacher. I was in that public school system uh, for a while. And then, and then I decided to come over here. I was traveling, I was backpacking in Europe. And then I heard, you know, it's really easy to get a job over here if you just come, right? So I was like, okay, let me try it. So I came over here. Two weeks later, I was the director of a preschool. <laughs> so I said, okay, sounds great. You know, so it's working in the office there and managing those English teachers. And this is a snippet from a, a, a larger, uh, a larger um, uh, narrative here. But narratives are constructed along temporal, these comes, comes back to scales, these temporal scales, these scales of time. And narratives are constructed uh, in temporal ways here. And we can see what's happening here. You've got, um, uh, you, you, uh, argue with the dump, right, okay. Um, I'm struggling for the, for the British English word for that. There we are. I told you, I said that about I'm a northern migrant and, yeah, and social linguistics. Anyway, um, uh, so what a wonderful prop that was. Uh, so uh, we've got, uh, we've got, anyway, back to temporal scales here. We've got first and became, was for a while, and then, and then. Uh, and I uh, was traveling, was backpacking, and then, uh, uh, so I came two weeks later, 
um, I had a, uh, you can see what's happening here. Um, there's different temporal markers first and then for a while uh, and uh, two weeks later that structure the narrative as unfolding along a sequential temporal axis. We can also see time um, marked in the tense of verbs. There's uh, past tense and present continuous to the verbs here. Um, narratives are constructed along temporal dimensions and they often uh, make events appear more sequential and less complex than they are in reality. Uh, and in particular, they can make events seem causative. Okay, so what sort of, sort of something makes something sort of sort of sort of happen here, um, and this is just a snippet. And this, these are these these are just me sitting down over a coffee with uh, my interviewees here and letting them talk in these open-ended, semi-structured interviews. And once you kind of dive into the data and pull out the data, there's this interesting sort of stuff sort of, sort of, sort of happens here. And um, there's uh, temporal scales there. There's also spatial scales here. I was in that public school system, come over here, backpacking in Europe, job over here, just come, came over here, working in the office there. And these are all spatial constructions here. Um, uh, and these constructions locate people or actors and events in space and time. And I'm highlighting the spatial dimensions here uh, because they serve to position the narrator in, in, play, in space and demonstrate the routes traversed between one place or space and the current place or space here. Once again, these are constructed as sequential and unbroken paths when migrant routes are often more complicated. With that said, it may be the case that routes for northern migrants are more sequential and unbroken than for migrants fleeing poverty or atrocity such as undocumented migrants or refugees. It may be that the decision to move and the process of carrying out the migration is easier when privileged migrants can traverse visa systems. And of course, there's often overlap between space and time, since these dim dimensions are often interrelated here. Um, I, I hope that, uh, the, that's, that's convincing enough. Um, the, the, uh, the, we've got a couple of things here. Um, so um, what's happening here? We've got uh, two occasions where Lisa quotes herself. So I was like, OK, so I said, OK. And they look very, very similar with so introducing the quotative, I was like, or I said, and OK preceding what is quoted. And they serve, I think, to position the narrator as an active agent in the migration narrative. Um, Lisa agrees to certain things happen, happening. They don't just happen to her. Yeah, okay. And so she's kind of constructing herself as an agent. Um, and this might be different from more privileged migrants than less privileged migrants here um, and in terms of agency and structure. Well, we'd have to look but, um, and see how that, that, that plays out. But um, uh, and we've also got here, um, uh, big, um, I'll skip that bit there. But, uh, um, but we've got, um, uh, you know, and you know here. These are really interesting. Um, these are really, really, really interesting here. Um, uh, uh, where are we here? Um, uh, the, the, this, this, the, it could be the throwaway. We use, we say, you know, you know, in conversation all the time, right? Um, but um, they're used in conversation, sort of, sort of commonly. Uh, but on a different level, it could be that the interviewee, in this case Lisa, is involving the interviewer, in this case me. Um, in the co-construction of objective knowledge about the reasons for migration. Uh, it's it's uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the interviewer, me, is invited to share in the telling of the narrative. Um, the interviewer is the interlocutor in a story, and the interview becomes an important space and time for the interviewee to position themselves more generally within their own scales of space and time here. Yeah, and so there's a there's um uh, there's, there's 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 that there, and this comes up quite a bit, and I'll show you some of the other data where it comes up here. Here's Herbie. He's 45. Uh, he's a, a white male American. Um, they say that some people are, you know, they say that some people come here because they can't make it in their own country. And they say that. I don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, I think the people that come to Taiwan are looking for adventure, looking for fun. There are some idiots, idiots running away from trouble, of course. You know, I think. 
But I just feel like people feel like they have freedom here. And for all the things that people complain about, I think they also get that they're privileged enough. Privilege is directly kind of talked about here. Um, and um, so there's, there's that to, to, to think about here. Once again, if we look at the temporal scales, there's less here on, in terms of time dimensions. Come because uh, there's causatives there, looking, there's different verbs, um, verb forms there, here. Um, and more interesting is the spatial dimensions here. People come here in their own country, come to Taiwan, idiots running away from trouble, have freedom here. And these are all spatial dimensions that are in the, in the, the, the evident in the narrative, uh, in, in the narrative here. Um, um, this positions, um, they're all used to describe the, the motivations of northern migrants. And this positions northern migrants as moving seamlessly from one place to another um, uh, on the basis of motivations and factors that they have agency and control over. And once again, it might be the, might be the case that this agency and control is a distinction between privileged and less privileged migrants and something I want to explore a little bit further uh, in this research here. Um, Lisa quotes herself. Um, Herbie quotes others. And so we've got they say, they say, they say, people feel like, people complain about. And so here we can see um, uh, these, uh, these narr both narratives, both Lisa's and Herbie's narratives are heteroglossic in, in Bakhtin's terms. They are multi-voiced. Yeah, it's not just um, uh, other people's voices narrate the experience of migration as much as the narrator's voice does. Um, one significance is that um, uh, Herbie is co-constructing the motivations of northern migrants in particular ways that challenge more negative assessments that people, whoever they are, uh, make. Um, we don't know if this is um, uh, Taiwanese uh, people uh, or other uh, northern migrants. We, we're not sure who these people are here. Um, uh, 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 those who these they say here. Um, uh, but uh, we can um, we can see that kind of uh, there's a relative positioning here between Herbie's voice and versus the voices of others in this particular uh, dynamic here. Um, and once again, you get you know and you know here. Yeah, that, that co-construction of the narrative with the interviewer. You know what I mean, you know what I'm saying, yeah? Um, and uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's that one here. Um, moving on, um, thinking about how do and why do northern migrants learn local languages here. Um, I've got um, a, a quote here, uh, and I basically say, and has your Mandarin language proficiency sort of improved? And this is to, to, how are you taken to be? Sort of kind of, how does the Chinese get you around in society here? As a foreigner who's been there long enough to speak the language, what's the sort of attitude compared to someone who doesn't speak the language? Can you sense the difference? Not great interview technique with all those questions. Uh, I have to have to be honest there. Uh, but um, but Tim takes it in his stride here and answers the question. He's British um, and he answers the question here. Well, yes, I do. Can you sense a difference here? So you know, that answer, answers my final question here. But at the same time, you know, you say ni hao or xie xie and to a taxi driver, and they say, oh, your Chinese is so good. Um, so that kind of attitude, that very very nice attitude that Taiwanese people will have. Um, so you've kind of always got that. To to a certain extent, oh, your Chinese is so good. So now I'm kind of, well, does he really mean that or is he being polite, you know? But it's helped me get around a lot of social situations, right? Sure. And that's another thing about the expat community. That kind of person, that was his voice, and I don't mean to be too critical about it, that stays here 20 years and can say half a dozen phrases and that's it. So there's a really, I mean, I, I love this, this one here. Um, there's, uh, there's, uh, um, we can see that he's been there for 25 years. He quotes the evaluations of Mandarin speakers um, while also describing and narrating specific linguistic interactions in Mandarin. Um, it's also it's how Mandarin speakers evaluate his competence that is at the heart of his relation to the language here. This is difficult to interpret the, the whether or not it's polite or whether or not it's being a genuine compliment with his Chinese here. Um, uh, it's, it's, di it's difficult to interpret these cross-cultural norms and their expression in and through language in terms of kind of politeness here. Um, and so um, 
But ultimately, Tim's linguistic abilities have helped him get around what he calls social situations, meaning the day to day cultural and linguistic interactions with Mandarin uh, speaking uh, uh, lo local Taiwanese people here. Um, and he uses um, you, and, and we've got uh, I've, I've sort of said this, this about this one here. Um, uh, so there's that one there. Um, and he's uh, he uses and another thing. Oh, that, sorry, and that's another thing, and I, which I think is kind of introduces sort of an evaluative observation about certain members of what he calls the expat community, even though Tim later on tells me that he doesn't like the term expat. He actually says, I, I prefer the time term migrant. And yet he will talk about the expat community. And this is an example of the, how this term it moves. It's a very mobile term in and of itself. Um, people will, um, will, will use it, but then they will distance themselves from it. And then they will, they will adopt it in, in, in certain contexts and not others here. Um, uh, and, uh, and, um, and, um, uh, uh, and and and, uh, and and his evaluations of certain members of the community are personified in the category or categorical figure of that kind of person. Um, in this case, it's based on language competence here, um, and uh, and he, the, the lowering of the voice. It's not sh we're not sure who's going to overhear this. <laughs> we were at Huashan Park. <laughs> outside, and I know, but he lowers his voice on the on the on the recording, and sort of, uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, anyway, um, so uh, um, but, uh, 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 but there we are here, um, and you and we've got um, you know and you know those things turn up again, yeah, those little bits of language turn up, and they're doing quite a lot of work. Um, a lot of co-construction happening there here. Um, this is uh, something else to speaking localized a lot of varieties here. Liam is uh, um, a white male American, uh, 50 years old. Um, I mean, I, I find, I mean, I've been with people, guys, for, for years in Beijing studying Mandarin, and then you hear them talk and they sound like a textbook, right? Right, sound like I don't sound like any, and what he's trying to say here, I speak with a little bit of a twang or, or a drawl, which I think is valuable, um, uh, has some benefits. I mean, people r might rather hear that than a textbook, right? Um, and he goes on, I won't read that, you can um, just sort of have a, have a look at uh, that one there. Um, but this excerpt here, um, which we'll look at for here, highly metalinguistic. This is language that is used to talk about language. Um, uh, like any language, not all varieties of Mandarin are valued equally in Taiwan's sociolinguistic marketplace. Um, here, Liam describes his own Mandarin speech as having a twang or a drawl. Um, the notions of twangs and drawls are not linguistic concepts. They are social evaluations of uh, of uh, uh, usually uh, used to describe certain uh, varieties of English, uh, rural and non-standard varieties of English are, are described as having twangs and drawls here. Um, and Liam maps these evaluations of English onto the varieties of Mandarin here. Okay, and it's sort of the, that 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 evaluative uh, observations that are used for English are mobile and he's mapping them onto uh, Mandarin varieties here, um, which is sort of, again, how these terms and these, these concepts are, are moving around here. Um, and um, uh, he goes on here um, uh, uh, to discuss expats who, doesn't, who don't master any more than basic Mandarin. In this case, those who cannot say hello or thank you after 10 years plus invoking a temporal scale. Um, uh, and uh, uh, for, uh, also, uh, Liam uh, uh, has, talks about linguistic competencies associated with level of education, highly educated people, motivation, didn't want it, and then he so, seems to accept that language learning is difficult for some people when he says that didn't get it. Yeah, okay. Uh, this competence or lack of it is key to integrating into Taiwanese society um, uh, by connecting with local people for Liam here. Um, and we've got here, right, it's not you know, but we've got right, 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 right here, which is doing similar work. Um, uh, got this one here. Um, and you communicate with your family in Mandarin, so you've got uh, Mandarin. I, I won't read that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you, because you can read it quicker than I can. I can say it. <laughs> I 
There's some interesting things going on here, some judgments here. Um, Nathan is in 2029 here. Uh, the temporal scales or the space and the scale here, um, it's spatial scales are really important here. Um, Taiwanese originally from here, from Changhua, so he speaks. Uh, Taiwanese, the local, uh, born in Taipei, poor Taiwanese. Yeah, uh, 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 and there's the association between location and and space and what people speak or what people are expected to speak and how those uh, and how uh, as a uh, uh, marrying into a Taiwanese family, uh, he sort of internalised sort of uh, some of those ideologies of language uh, that link space and place with uh, who speaks what and registers and styles and different language varieties uh, 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 varieties uh, here. Um, and I've got, and I've pulled this one here. Um, Taiwanese, if I was going to study anything, it's going to be more Mandarin. Taiwanese would always like, it's kind of like a luxury that I don't need. And the the interesting thing is that um, under the Kuomintang, um, you, the association of Taiwanese was very much not with luxury, but with inferiority um, and uh, the, through the Mandarin spread campaign um, and, and, and Mandarin spread policy for, for, for almost 50 years. Um, and so um, uh, there's, there's a sort of a jarring juxtaposition there uh, between that ideology and then the idea and then the, the, the notion that kind of prestige or functionality. Um, and perhaps this is indicative of Nathan's status as a privileged outsider. Um, and that's what I'm trying to talk about here today. It's the key to better integration into Taiwanese culture and specifically his extended Taiwanese family. But learning it requires time and effort. And that's possibly why he frames it as a luxury that he doesn't uh, need here. Um, last, last, last bits of data here, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, um, home and away. We've got Herbie again here. Um, um, so is this home then? Mm, yeah, it flips. So when I, I can't remember the exact time, but your world flips when you go home and you feel like this is kind of weird. You know, like you're not, it's not really seven years, nine years. I don't know when it was. I mean, for me, I think about it in more recent terms. I live in Palm Grove, which is like this resort, resort area, kind of with a huge pool and hit shit like that. Right. And so when I go home, I have to sleep on my mum's couch or on my bed that was on the floor in the corner with my mum pulling out the room and, you know, shit like that. So it's like, like, why do I want to come home to Ohio? That too... That's supposed to be my vacation when I'm living in a vacation area, you know, like with a pool and all this stuff. Yeah, and so I feel like it's flipped to where whatever, but there was a time before that that I knew that this was my home and Ohio was the place I used to live. You know what I mean? So if I had to guess, seven years. We've got temporal, uh, we've got spatial dimensions there, which are really interesting here. Your world flips, the world flips on an, on an axis, it's a spatial dimension here. Home, resort area, uh, uh, the floor and the uh, bed on the floor, um, and we've got uh, different spatial dimensions here. Uh, these locations can be countries or regions at the macro level, um, as well as corners of rooms where one's bed is at the micro level here. And this um, emplacement of home varies from the, uh, from the general to the specific here. Um, and there are the, obviously when you're talking about home, you would expect spatial dimensions, people to talk about space when talking about conceptions of home here. But there are also temporal dimensions here. We've got when, the exact time, when, seven years, nine years, recent terms, don't know when, when I go home, when I'm living, time before that, vacation, which is a temporal, that's, that's, a, that's a, a time, a de, 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 de delimited period of, of being off work. Um, there was a time before that I used to live seven years here. And we see the temporal construction of home uh, in, these, uh, in, these, in this narrative as well here. Um, and once again, you know turns up here. You know, you know, you know, you know what I mean. Doing that work of co-construction in the interview to narrate arguably uh, conceptions of where home sort of is here. All right. OK, that's um, me wrapping up here. All right. Conclusions. Um, well, the theoretical framework of this research project is unfolding um, and the conclusions 
I can draw from a few short excerpts are only really very tentative here. Nonetheless, nonetheless I, uh, I think several things can be said. The first is that northern migrant trajectories and experiences are amenable to sociological and anthropological analysis through the languages, discourses, repertoires and narratives that they deploy here. Here we've seen primarily short narratives in which migrants tell stories about how and why they and other northern migrants moved, where they call home, the languages and language varieties that they use and how they interact with and integrate into their new cultures and societies. Second, the macro structural affordances and constraints towards mobility are reproduced are produced and reproduced, contested and negotiated at the micro level of conversational interaction, even in the somewhat artificial context of the interview. The, this interface between the micro and the macro is important. Social scientists often see this as a duality or opposition, the micro and the macro, um, or have done. Uh, but as the great sociolinguist John Gumpers teaches us in Monica Heller's words, that you can't actually have one micro versus macro. You can't actually have one without the other. You can't and you certainly can't explain social process without some place for social process to happen. Social process thus takes place in interaction here. Uh, and finally, this research has a different emphasis than uh, uh, Lang's uh, 2011 paper, being as it is grounded in sociolinguistic and linguistic anthropological approaches to interaction uh, mainly. But it seems to confirm and significantly benefits from drawing on her broader sociological theorizations. We can see how the subtle interplays between precarity and privilege are manifested in and navigated through small uh, narratives. All right. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic, Gareth. Really great to kind of uh, uh, get a sense of that joy of field work, something we've mi been missing uh, so much over the last um, uh, few years. Uh, it also reminded me that um, about 10 years ago, we had a project here on migration to and from um, uh, Taiwan. And one of the chapters that we were, we never managed to get was a chapter on. Um, Western migrants in, in Taiwan. We had, we had some proposals, but it never really um, uh, happened. Um, and, and I wasn't actually aware of, of, of Lang's uh, work, there, so I need to kind of go back um, and, and, and look at that. Um, I, 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 let me just start with one, one kind of question that you didn't really have a chance to touch upon, and that was about your uh, the case selection of this overall project. I was kind of curious about um, why you chose Thailand as your as your second case and not somewhere more comparable. I was immediately thinking of somewhere like um, Japan, South Korea. Um, so that was um, let me just start with, with that question. So the, um, the the I was looking for somewhere that was definitely in the global south and Thailand falls under that category there. And so looking at sort of global north to global south flows, mm. where you, and this is, I, I don't have, yeah. <laughs> this is a tricky question, where, where you locate Taiwan is a much trickier question. Lan actually does put Taiwan in the global south, and mm. I think that's, you know, so I, what I wanted to look at was um, somewhere nearby, um, somewhere sort of Southeast Asia, um, uh, that was definitely in the global south, and, and that way you can compare um, movement from the north to the south and arguably within the global north as well. Great, Stuart. A very enjoyable talk, Gareth. Um, it reminds me at one level of Zygmunt Bauman's uh, modernity, I think, the distinction between the elite who can travel and be tourists wherever they want to and have agency over where they go and the, the vast majority of migrants who don't um, if we focus, as you have done, on telling stories, the narratives, I've got one or two um, follow-ons, I think, add-ons perhaps. Uh, any narrative will tend to have some point that needs resolved and then some denouement in it. Uh, and any narrative will take account of who the audience are that's being talked to. So. You have described how the narrators uh, talked about their lives careering from one place to another, 
verbs, uh, but it ends up in their analysis being a career move. Um, it's a sort of elevator pitch, it's a, 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 trying to justify what they've done to the particular audience that they're with. Now, from their point of view, you're like a, an uber expat. <laughs> Not only are you positioned so that you can move easily from one place to another, whether it's your place of research, uh, but you've acquired the language and you can comment, you're in such a position, you can comment upon what others have done. Um, so I wonder to what extent uh, the responses would not have put, included you know so much, etc. if the interlocutor had been somebody else, or you'd ask them in the United States or their home territory, or you'd ask people who had uh, moved to Taiwan and then decided it wasn't for them and then gone back. So the denouement of the story might be your the final question you asked, so is this then your home? Is, is that what's happening? Or expat is somebody who's in exile, but whose attention is to their real home, which is where they came from. So what to what extent are these people trying to put down roots? Uh, to what extent are they concerned about their children's um, schooling and the, their children's educational development, whether they're going to be subject to conscription or not, which I don't suppose they would be. Um, there's these parameters coming into play. And it's not a criticism of anything you said. I think it's an encouragement to, to look into these complicating factors. Uh, they are great. Um, uh, 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 questions and uh, avenues for further research. Um, I think that the positionality is always sort of key and, 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 and grounding yourself and figuring out where you sit in all this, or me, where I sit in, in all this, is, is something that is probably a whole chapter in and of itself, um, me methodologically. And I, and I wonder what, uh, and I wonder if some comparative work can be done to sort of see whether or not sort of some of those you know, like you say, returnees who, who, who found out that Taiwan wasn't from there. What, what sort of stories they tell and, 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 and things like that and, and, and versus people who put down roots and, and, and things like that. Um, they are really good questions. I don't have good answers for them right now, uh, but uh, they're certainly sort of kind of things to, to, things to think about and, 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 and thank you. Okay, yeah, you okay um, my uh, focus on East Asia is primarily Korea. Okay, but a lot of what uh, you, you showed us today um, resonates. I have a friend, a Korean friend, who for a while taught English at Chichen University. One of her colleagues there was an American who had taught English at the same university for 10 years, and she said, it cannot be asked for a cup of coffee in Korean. Now, I'm not going to go into I can give you so many other examples. Um, but it's not just uh, people who have English as their mother tongue, who are northern uh, immigrants uh, in, in, into East Asia and certainly in Korea, because I know <coughs> Romanians, Russians, just by chance, I don't think uh, people like that out. And so I wonder, is your research going to include uh, migrants from the north whose first language is not English, because the language is a cultural driver? And their experiences and perceptions are going to be different. That's a really good question, and there's um, a few dimensions to that. The language, this this started out as actually being called the Anglophone diaspora. <laughs> uh, so, and then I quickly realised that wasn't going to work at all here. But the interviews um, uh, are conducted in English, but a lot of, um, not a lot, but there are quite a few of my interviewees have uh, Russian as a first language, um, but then perhaps migrated to the States um, and then uh, speak English as a, the, a second first language. Um, uh, I've got, I'm just trying to think what, what, who else I've got. Uh, I've, I've got a Spanish speaker. 
um, but but using English again as a, as a, as, a, as an L as an L one. So I think what, it, what I'm trying to get at there is it kind of sort of comes down to the the a lot of this is facilitated the mobility and uh, migration is facilitated by English as a global language, um, and perhaps that's sort of a theoretical kind of. Um, uh, paradigm that that, that that explains a lot of this mobility and a lot of this migration. Just, just, just a follow-up question to, to Evad's one in terms of your um, your sample selection. Uh, was uh, how long do people actually have to be uh, in Thailand or Taiwan to actually be uh, in the sample? Uh, and did it have to be work, or would students also um, uh, potentially be in that in that sample? So uh, it, it was uh, over one year. Okay. So um, and I, I do have students, but I've I, I've got one I think student, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and um, that is that data isn't here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, uh, what I'm trying to do is to um, narrow down that uh, that selection criteria for the research that I'm doing moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I've got to think about, about kind of who, who gets in, included and, 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 and that sort of thing. Um, and that's something that I will sort of think about. Thank you so much. It's fantastic. Um, I really, really learned a lot. And uh, I, I've got so many questions, so I have to be very selective. Um, you focused on uh, spatial and uh, temporal uh, sort of uh, perspective, uh, looking at the uh, interviews. I wonder um, how about the gender factors and the age group factors, how that uh, influence their experience and their you know, trajectory in uh, their migration uh, experience. Um, can I ask the second question? <laughs> Sorry. Um, also a very simple one. Have you asked them about uh, how they define themselves? Are they uh, expats? Or are they migrants? Because that's quite important how they define it and define themselves. Thank you. So, which one should I answer first? Hang on. Would the, you have uh, and then I'll answer the second one first. Hang on. Uh, so, yes, I have. Um, and I haven't done, done, shown that data here, but I do sort of say to people, how do you feel about the term migrant versus expat? And I, I frame that in different ways, and I do that, I frame that in different ways in the conversation. It's usually not quite as blunt as that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, you, but people were, are very happy to talk about it, um, and they will narrate, and they will tell you that they don't like the term expat, even though they've said they're using the term expat throughout the interview. Most of them. Not, well, not all, but it's, it patterns in complex ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure. And that sort of patterning in complex ways leads back to the first question, which is uh, uh, gender and age. Um, I don't have enough data yet to see kind of how gender and age pattern yet. Once I have 100 interviews, then that might kind of um, uh, that, that, that those those questions and and, 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 and and thinking about sort of how those narratives kind of, kind of unfold and and and. and, and and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not um, uh, is, uh, is is something that, that, that I've, I've got to think about. So. But it seems that just by you know, looking in the Thai history, that seemingly the male is the dominant group. So I'll just you know, pick yeah, up the thinking yeah. also from yours. So seemingly, actually, quite a few older uh, age group rather than uh, young men. Yeah, yes. So, the, the, so um, uh, the, the, in my in my sample, men are overrepresented, um, and I don't know why. The, well, I know partly why. That's because they, they, we know. Yeah, and they're also white. So yes. Um, so they are overrepresented. Over, over um, uh, I I know that that's because they are overrepresented as a population in in Taipei. But I also wonder uh, uh, if. Uh, Women don't want to sit down with a strange researcher um, in, a, in, a, in a coffee shop, and uh, there, there could be that at play as well. And I, I but I can't, I can't find that out. Um, uh, the the you know um, it comes back to I think um, uh, race in particular is one of these categories that that that, that privilege and, pri and privilege mobilities. Um, Draws on and and, and mobilises in particular sort of sort of sort of ways here. Um, I would like to have more people of colour in my um, in my samples certainly, but the. You know.
Thank you. you can only right, yeah, Hi, um, thank you so much. Really interesting talk. Um, kind of related to that question because you just brought up privilege, um, and this is the you know the title of your topic. Um, besides that little bit where it said uh, the the person who said that the privilege was enough or something. The privilege enough, yeah, yeah. yeah. They gave that their privilege enough, he says. Right, yeah, as opposed to not enough privilege. But um, <laughs> I guess uh, I was wondering what uh, if if many of them did um, talk about privilege at all or had any. Uh, brought it up in their narratives, or if you perhaps ask them, did they feel privileged? So um, it's a question that is on the research questions, the, 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 specifically about the interplay between privilege and precarity. Um, and I often frame that in terms of, can you tell me about uh, your experiences of privilege? Can you tell me about your experiences of discrimination? And people were very happy to talk about that. Um, there's a lot of data in the data that I, I mean, that I've got, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, thousands of, of words, uh, tens of thousands of words to, to, to go through here. And so that is, uh, people do talk about it and they're quite happy to talk about it. Um, and in general, people will tell you that they feel uh, more privileged than discrimination, but discrimination does exist. But the, that's that whole talk in and, in and of itself, which is probably, uh, I should call it privileged outsiders too. Uh, and, uh, but uh, that's a, yes, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, uh, John, you're there, Stuart. Hi, I'm James from Having Fun Studies. Uh, my question is quite like methodological ones, like, um, especially on online resources, like what kind of online resources are you trying to collect in, on social media? But more importantly, like, how what the role of online if you use the space metaphor what the cyberspace like what's the role of cyberspace in your ethnography or in your field work is it like a part of the site or it's a supplementary resources for your in-depth interview in your site that is a good question um i think uh Drawing on the spatial metaphor, as you say, um, I see it as a, an extension of uh, of of the of the, of, of the physical space of, of where the of these migrants are located. Um, uh, but um, and the reason why, I, and uh, this is sort of thinking off the top of my head. The reason why I would think that um, is that um, the communities sort of coalesce online, much as they would do in bars or coffee shops or other sort of kind of kind of kind of spaces as well and they and and they coalesce online and they look like or they feel like uh, uh spaces that are an extension of the of the of the of the physical space but that's a, 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 a something to, to think about but did you find any kind of differences in in the in the trend in, in the two because i was particularly thinking about the precarity element was that coming out more in the kind of online discussion than actual uh, the face-to-face uh, -face discussions? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, the main difference between online and offline spaces is that people are much nicer in person. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. the, and, and so, so um, the people do complain online and they complain and, and they sort of give rise to that precarity and, and that sort of thing. Um, being, during the pandemic, I've been looking at these uh, Facebook sites uh, for the last two, two years now, um, but in Thailand and, and, and quite a lot of activity in Thailand, uh, but Thailand as well. Um, and uh, people sort of got stuck um, in place uh, due to the pandemic. Um, and uh, and uh, these biopolitical controls and material challenges um, sort of um, uh, are evident that people talk about sort of online and, and, and perhaps less so in, in offline spaces. Go ahead. Can I have a follow-up? Yes. The, I, I, in my perception that the social media posting sometimes is quite like out of the context or fragmented or lack of um, storytelling. In that way, how do you cope with uh, your fascinating narrative analysis like it's really eye-opening to me, but like, how do you cook that kind of uh, way of analysis to the mm -hmm. online resource, the like data? 
Yeah, so narrative analysis doesn't always sort of kind of kind of work in, in, in quite, or at least you have to do different things to it to to make it work for for online, uh, you know, comments and posts and things like that. Um, uh, that requires um, uh, uh, some methodological. Um, uh, sophistication in, in terms of thinking about what is what is actually work. I've got over a thousand posts that I'm still sort of going through. Um, that's a big, uh, but, but, there's, but there is quite a lot of sociolinguistic work uh, on sort of how uh, online uh, communities uh, uh, talk and, and narrate and co-construct um, their experiences. And that digital discourse has been around for a decade or more, you know. So I draw. I can. I do have resources in sociolinguistics to draw on uh, thinking about digital discourse. Yes. Thank you. I want to focus on your idea of co-construction. First, uh, three quick anecdotes. Firstly, when I went to um, was doing fieldwork in rural Taiwan, it was assumed by that I was not only me got man, an American <laughs> a talker big nose, but also that I was a Mormon missionary. And I think if we're thinking about the history of um, expats in Taiwan, the, those who went as Christian missionaries are really probably quite important. Secondly, I, about 20, 25 years ago, I was on an airplane from Bangkok to Taipei, sitting behind two people talking to each other in fluent um, Thai, in fluent Taiwanese. It's only when we were getting off the plane that I realised they were both African and they were talking. So I would link that to the sort of precarious migration where just a few years earlier, if you had got a job in Taiwan, you were confined to a certain area. It was like an inverse of the treaty port's uh, freedom for expats. And then thirdly, when you went, in those days, when you went through the airport to uh, passport control, you went through where it said aliens. Mm -hmm. that way, it's, it's yeah, it's sort of changed. Yeah, it's still, it's still called aliens. aliens. So, mm -hmm. so my wider question is um, the extent to what to which there have been changes in perceptions of expats and experiences of expats since uh, 2001 to 2007 that aligns with the changing nature of uh, Taiwan people going as tourists or as students or for other reasons, lifestyle choices elsewhere, mm -hmm. including to the PRC, and the change in nature of immigration, uh, the sort of thing dealt with in, the, in your series. Uh, to, to what extent can you fit in what you're trying to describe? describe another easy question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, in, into those wider processes of, of, of change. So th this has given me some uh, pause, for, uh, and, and I have thought about this. Um, and what um, and those the danger with doing this, as it is, is that they that these migrants become sort of, well, what Lamb calls them free floating cosmopolitans, right? And I think that they become dislocated from wider structures and processes in Taiwanese society, perceptions as well um, in Taiwanese society, as, uh, 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 and, and that is problematic, I think. Um, so um, one way to remedy that is to talk to sort of kind of um, Taiwanese people, see what Taiwanese people think of kind of, kind of northern migrants as well. I mean, that Pew research, for example, the one that, that, that looks at high skilled migration, for example, uh, uh, that, that graph I, I, I showed, I'd be interested to see how that quantitatively worked in Taiwan as well, I, 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 for example. Um, whether or not I've got the resources to do that is a, is a different question. Um, but I think um, uh, that, that somewhere, and not just somewhere, I think throughout the, the project or throughout the book project, uh, locating uh, those wider structures and processes um, in there is, is, is going to be important. But then I have to do the same for Thailand, and I'm less familiar with Thailand in terms of, you know, in terms of, uh, I don't have however many years experience in, in, in Thailand. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely something to um that has given me um some uh some some thoughts here. Um and 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 that that might mean doing different things with it, but I haven't quite worked out yet what what where that where, where that location works or where that location lives, if you like. So so back to the um, um have you thought about how you, how you're gonna actually 
structure the book. I don't think when you with writing books, one of the key decisions is um, what are the kind of the big chapters, um, and are you going to look at Taiwan and Thailand together in, in, in comparative chapters or, or separate chapters? So you kind of um, got, I, think, I know for me in my last book, working out the chapter structure then was that a real key moment. And are you are you there yet? Uh, I've got one that I've used to get grants with. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, but uh, and as it stands, uh, they are kind of comparing um, both uh, Thai, uh, migrants in Taiwan and Thailand um, in, in to, together and so thematically um, structured in terms of um, uh, of, of how they how, uh, so all together um, and thematically structured rather than sort of side by side mm. comparisons here. Um, so I've got an idea of how the book is structured, and it, and I'm quite happy that it's not just just for. Kind of, uh, it's, it's not just for, for external purposes. It, it is actually sort of. It, I think that it sort of um, it, it sort of hangs together. But I, I think it will change. Mm. Yeah, I think it will. I, th I know it will change. Yeah. Just thinking about the um, the kind of overseas um, uh, community in in Taiwan. Like one of the big components is uh, overseas or American Taiwanese. Right. Um, I was wondering, do they um, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> and I think it's really, um, uh, uh, I think you, um, I think because of the relationship between uh, Taiwanese Americans, for example, with Taiwan, mm either through citizenship or through visas and, mm -hmm. and sometimes not yeah. um, uh, and also kind of questions ethnicity and language competence or lack of language competence um, I think that to to, uh, to look at that population in, in detail uh, I've got to be asking very specific and different questions that, mm. that, that I perhaps framed um, other interviews with um, that's uh, that's uh, yeah uh, and and I think that will um, throw up a whole um, kind of, sort of set of um, dimensions worth exploring. Yeah. So I think we've just about got time for maybe one final question. Does anyone, anyone want to come in or even come back with a, a, a follow up question? Um, uh, if not, then um, maybe we should um, have a pause in our kind of Taiwan studies uh, discussion because, of course, we do have. A, another Taiwan Studies event at, at three o'clock was organised by the politics department. We've got two politics PhD students, one talking about um, and gender politics and political representation, and one talking about um, um, political party relations between uh, Hong Kong and Taiwanese uh, political parties. It's at three o'clock. I can't remember which the, the room. Um, oh, four four two six. Four four two six. Okay. So that gives us an hour and a half um, uh, break. Uh, but before that, let's um, uh, give Gareth another very big talk. Um, and we will continue Thank the you. migration discussion. We've got um, one on the, the May 31st, uh, and we'll kind of give you reminders for that as well. Um,